Okay, so um, thank you for coming to the talk. Uh, it's it's the last day, nearly the end. Um, so uh, uh, I'm Ian Rogers from Google, and uh, I'm Wayling from Intel. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, um, we're we're giving a presentation together, um, and uh, it's kind of awkward because we're on the stage together, and it's <laughs> and so on. So um, because of the title of the the conference, Linux Plumbers. Um, we're kind of assuming that you're familiar with what Linux is. And um, we're kind of also kind of hoping that you're familiar with what the perf tool is. And uh, if you're not, I really recommend, you know, uh, Julia Evans is uh, a zine, but also Brendan Gregg's uh, stuff as well. So kind of the, the big question is, is what are the metrics? And that's kind of what this talk is uh, all about. So, <clears throat> The, why do we have metrics? So we, we have events. Why aren't events good enough uh, for, for everything? So uh, when we have uh, events, it's often unclear what are the units which are used by a counter. So we have bytes versus cache lines, uh, cycles um, versus instructions. There are different clock sources. Do, does a, a, a counter count speculative events or not? When uh, the perf tool runs, uh, we do uh, different kinds of uh, aggregation. Uh, of, uh, of uh, counters. And so the goal with metrics is to take uh, multiple different counters from different PMUs and, uh, uh, and to combine these into something which is human readable and kind of like human uh, understandable. And to hopefully do this in a way that's consistent across uh, different architectures and different vendors. So uh, we have uh, groups of metrics. Uh, we call these metric groups. Uh, Jerry, is that one of yours? <laughs> Not sure. OK, so we have, we have metric groups, which are, are groups of metrics. Um, so an, an example of a, a group of metrics could be like a metrics related to data sharing. Then we have individual metrics uh, within uh, the metric group. And the metrics are comprised of uh, events from different PMUs. Uh, so in this diagram, we're showing like we've got a memory controller, last level cache, uh, the CPU, uh, and interconnect. So the uh, the events uh, they either come to us from uh, Sysfs uh, or they get specified in uh, JSON files. So the top thing here is just showing you can see the, the CPU events uh, from Sysfs, uh, and we have the an example of one of the uh, the JSON uh, encoded events. Uh, the JSON encoded events, they get compiled and built into the perf tool. Uh, so if you get newer perf tools, you get newer events, you get newer metrics. Uh, so. If you want to see what the, the metrics themselves uh, are, you can do it through perf list. So it's what we recommend. Uh, if you do dash dash details, it'll show you what the, uh, what the metrics uh, expressions are. So how we actually compute the, the metrics. So the, in this example, we've got TMA core bound. The top value is the, the metric expression. And then the value below that is a threshold expression uh, that we use for coloring the, the values from the metrics, either red or green. And I'll speak a bit more about that later. So because it was the first metric in PerfList, I chose as an example TMA core bound. Um, and it, it's a somewhat complicated metric, but it, it kind of like shows you what's going on uh, with, with metrics. So uh, we start off, we've got this uh, max operation, which is uh, either going to be zero uh, in the case that the, the value on the right is negative, uh, or otherwise it's going to be this value which is computed from two other metrics, uh, TMA backend bound and TMA memory bound, uh, and it's going to subtract one from the other. So um, I've drawn arrows in the diagram hopefully somewhat clear. It doesn't really matter what the details are, but in this uh, example, the lowercase values are all uh, other metrics. So the metrics are built up from other metrics. Uh, the uppercase values are all uh, events. And uh, as well in there, we've got some constants. We've got a five in the backend bound uh, expression uh, and so on. So, Where are all of these events and metrics coming from? Uh, and so um, uh, Intel, uh, we, we've been working, Google and Intel have been working together on a, a project called Valkyrie, 
the 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 events used to be on a, a website uh, called o1.org uh, but more recently they've uh, migrated to to github uh, and so there's this uh, intel perfmon uh, site the pushing of events and metrics used to be kind of a, a manual affair um, and so the events weren't getting updated that frequently uh, and so on now we have a, a single script which does everything uh, this is this uh, create perf uh, and this is uh, hosted on the uh, intel uh, perfmon site um, it's taking in json files and it's creating json files the the files it creates get put into the um the linux tree uh, via lkml the incoming uh, json files the event json uh, people are probably familiar with that for the server um, architectures so the xeons there are some additional metrics that get added in particular for uh, uncore uh, things and then there's this uh, tma uh, spreadsheet um, which is historically how intel has published its metrics um, it's a csv file here uh, intel used to publish it as an excel file uh, so um, some history there um, after we have the, the JSON files in the um, Linux tree, we have JSON files from other vendors uh, for other architectures. Uh, the jevents.py script runs and generates a pmuevents.c file. The pmu extract abstraction in the perf tool uh, uses what's in the pmuevents.c file. Um, and you don't really care what the details are. Okay, so before I start a new topic here, is there any question? Yeah. Events, uh, clear how they get added to perf, but the formulas for metrics, uh, who uh, invents those formula, they come from Intel, from the engineer at Intel, is that someone from the Linux community? So who, uh, makes the formulas so who's inventing formulas so the the tma metric spreadsheet the the person we we we, we blame for this is kind of mentioned down the bottom there is uh, ahmed yazin um and so most of the intel metrics are coming uh, from this spreadsheet uh, and so on but there's also a team within intel who create new metrics uh, and so on uh, there was a patch i sent last week for adding uh, upi bandwidth uh, metrics so, so in, uh, Intel uh, uh, writes those uh, metrics and uh, they come from Intel, right? So in, Intel published them via the Perfmon website and then we pull them into the, the Linux uh, tree via the, the, the create perf JSON uh, thing. And it doesn't have to be me who sends in the, 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 the updates to the, the Linux tree. <laughs> it, it can be anybody. It's, the, the expectation is that the, the, the formulas are, are produced by the hardware vendors. Anybody coming with the coming up with the core or uncore has to produce the JSON events and the JSON formulas that go with them. Yeah, there's some fudging. There's some metrics on things like TSX and things like that where you know I forward ported them and things like that. But it, it yeah, it, it's all coming from the vendors. So for our uh, project Valkyrie, we also try to standardize the event and metrics and also provide the common ones that we feel valuable for you. And uh, that's one thing that uh, I think is, is a value of, of our project. So I, I will uh, include a link to this uh, open source repo. So please check that out if you are interested. Okay, so now let's get started to the next topic. This is the top-down microarchitecture analysis method. So this is a method that's uh, proposed by Ahmad <laughs> Yazin in 2014. And this is a very uh, useful and easy-to-use methodology for you to do performance analysis and uh, try to find the true bottleneck of your program in, in, in out of order processors. So for this method, you don't need to have very deep knowledge on the microarchitecture but you uh, could still use it in, in using the tools that provide this method like uh, Vtune or like our Linux Perf tool to do this uh, methodology following the structures like showing in the graph here. 
So I will do a very simple example using the perf tool, how we can do this. So here, usually when we do the TMA, we start from the first level. And uh, if you look at, look at the graph here, on the first level, we have the four metrics, which are, uh, when we do the performance analysis, like running uh, using the top-down L1 metric group that's provided by the perf tool, we can get the value of these four metrics are all in the percentage value. And uh, if we uh, look at the graph here, we, we can clearly see that only uh, one of the metric, the backend bound, is highlighted in the red color. That's because um, for this method here, it tried to figure out which, uh, from the level one, it tried to figure out which category is more, most likely that your bottleneck falls into. So for our example here, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, I'm using a matrix multiplication workload from StressNG for this example. So here, the, my workload has the backend bound highlighted. So I, I, I know that for the next step to drill down, I will need to go into the next level of my metric, which are the children nodes of this backend bound node. Then uh, I can do this by easily using the TMA backend bound group. The unscore group is the suffix for this type of drill down. So when I do that in the next step, I got the uh, value of these two children node, the core bound and the memory bound. And then here we obviously see that my workload is a core bound uh, workload. So uh, two important features to notice here. First of all, if we look at the value of the four uh, metrics in the level one, the value of the four values should sum up to equal to 100%. So this is the property of, of TMA. Um, and also on the level two, the core bound node and the memory bound node, the value of them should sum up and equal to the value of backend bound. So now if we uh, continue with the same process to drill down to the, to the children nodes of my core bound, then I can do the TMA core bound group and then continue to the TMA poor utilization group. Then I do the same process until I reach the, the leaf, leaf node of, of this structure. And I see that I have the TMA ports utilized one and the TMA ports utilized two are the uh, likely to be my bottle, real bottlenecks here. So at this point, you can start to look into your program to do uh, to to do uh, program optimization based on this, or if you like, if you like, you can uh, also do some sampling on the events that related to this metrics. So um, <clears throat> on uh, Ice Lake uh, and newer models, what we do in kind of like the default uh, perf stat output is we put the top-down L1 uh, metrics uh, there for you uh, uh, to see. Um, yeah, we, we have top-down L1 on before ice like Intel architectures, uh, but we don't show them by, by default. I'll, I'll mention a bit about that uh, in, in a, uh, shortly. Um, you'll see here that the TMA retiring uh, metric doesn't have a, a threshold calculated. So it's neither red or, or uh, green, uh, and I'll go into that now. So um, metric thresholds are themselves metrics. Uh, quite commonly, a metric threshold will just be like the, the metric value and saying whether it's bigger than some value. Um, metric thresholds themselves can add extra events, and because of this, they can uh, cause multiplexing uh, because we have more events uh, programmed. And so when we kind of like default opt you into uh, metrics, we didn't want to have the multiplexing problem. And so that's why the retiring doesn't, uh, isn't colored in the, the, the default output. When you say that I want this metric, so you specify in the command line, I want, you know, uh, TMA core bound. Um, then uh, in that case, uh, we say, okay, you want the, the thresholds uh, now. And you, that means we're gonna program these extra events. Um, and you can opt out of that behavior by passing the, the metric no threshold um, flag. 
So as, as Waylon mentioned, you know, uh, one of the things that you want to do kind of like when you've got to a, a leaf in the, the TMA um, uh, tree is to kind of like identify where in your program uh, you're encountering this, this bottleneck. So uh, in the, the drill down uh, that, uh, that the Waylon then we, we got to this uh, TMA ports utilized one uh, metric. And with perflist-v, we get the, the long description uh, of what the, uh, the metric is. And um, it's the fraction of cycles where the CPU executed a total of one UOP uh, per cycle. Lots of other information there. But the bit I'm interested in is the bit I highlighted in red, which is the sample width. And so uh, the event mentioned there, this exe activity dot one port, uh, one port util, uh, we want to pass that through to perf record. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get a, a samples uh, in the, the benchmark. And we can analyze where these uh, one port uh, utilized uh, events are occurring with either perf report uh, or with you know uh, other visualizations like flame graphs and, uh, and so on. OK, EBS mode. Um, so e EBS is uh, event-based sampling, but it's something which is in the TMA spreadsheet and it causes controversy. Uh, so um, in, the, in the TMA uh, spreadsheet that there was uh, in the earlier slide, I can flip back to it. We're, we're breaking things down uh, into, into slots. We've got non-stalled and stalled uh, slots and we don't like the stalled slots. And um, in newer processors, the slots is an actual counter uh, that you can program and you can get counts for what the slots are. But in older processors, uh, so pre-Ice Lake, slots wasn't a counter. And so it had to be computed. Uh, and the way it was computed, um, if you didn't have hyperthreading enabled, it was straightforward. It was your pipeline width times the number of cycles. If you have hyperthreading enabled, then Roughly, the number of slots you're going to be using is half the, the number of it, half the pipeline width times the, the number of cycles. But of course, you've enabled hyperthreading because you're going to get uh, you're going to get uh, memory issues and so on on the other hyperthread. And in that situation, um, the non-stalled uh, hyperthread is going to get all of the slots. So there's an event for that called one thread active. And so what happens with EBS mode is the number of slots gets uh, scaled up by the number of times you have one thread active. The problem with this is that this counter is buggy and uh, it leads to the number of slots not being calculated correctly. And so because of this, uh, pre-ice lake, we don't enable top-down L1 because when you do the top-down L1 gathering, uh, it uses EBS mode. Uh, and it, it, if you're not doing system-wide, uh, profiling, or you're not doing uh, profiling on both uh, hyperthreads. If hyperthreading is disabled, this is not an issue, but we still disable it anyway by default. Uh, the reason it's controversial is uh, Intel are looking to make EBS mode disappear, and historically the perf tool has always had it and used it by default, um, because when people use the perf commands, they tend to be going perf command and then the benchmark that they want to profile. Um, so I would raise it here. So uh, something which is uh, kind of new in like 6.5-ish, uh, 6.6, why 6.5 we had this, I think even as early as 6.3, um, is that we support uh, hybrid processors. So uh, in this diagram here, we've got, um, we've got a, a per, per core type breakdown. So we've got top down L1 on both the performance CPU core PMU and on the CPU Atom uh, PMU, which is the efficiency core. Uh, and we've got the, the metrics for both uh, of their top-down L1 groups. The Atom processor has uh, somewhat more metrics than the, uh, than the um, performance core. Um, the thing that we don't like is we've got these uh, percentages on the right, and that means we're multiplexing. So that means the counter isn't always active uh, because we have to swap the counters around. And we're only doing this here for the Atom processor. Uh, and the reason for this is Perf has always historically given you a branch misrate count. 
And the atom processor doesn't have enough counters to calculate branch miss rate and to compute top down L1. Um, so maybe we want to get rid of branch, uh, so the branch miss rate are, um, from the default output. Um, but yeah, we can bug Arnaldo and people like this to, 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 to see what we should be doing there. So, do you want to? <laughs> okay, so having lots of metrics um, it, it, it is, is wonderful. You can compute all of these things, memory bandwidth, the, the TMA, do the drill downs and so on. Um, but there's no use in having them uh, unless they're actually you know, accurate and correct and, and giving you numbers which mean things. Um, and so um, Wayland did all the work. Uh, she wrote a, um, a, a validation, validation test. So what the validation test does, it does things like the, 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 the parent-child relationship in the TMA. It makes sure that those things add up to things like, you know, if it's top down L1, they should all add up to 100%. So the, there's a, a bunch of things like that. So in earlier versions of the Perf tool, it was quite common to see that we would double scale values so that we would compute things like uh, memory bandwidth in petabytes per second. And so you would always see that you were you, you had zero petabytes a second because it was a too, too big a unit. Um, these days, hopefully, the metrics are somewhat correct. Um, the test doesn't always pass for me, but we're working on it. <laughs> so, okay. So, um... Yes, I, th I think like uh, Ian has already been mentioning that we don't like time multiplexing because that hurts our accuracy. And the reason why we are having that is that PMU events is helpful for performance analysis, but there are so many events, um, but we have only a limited number of hardware counters. So in the case that we need to collect um, more events than the real hardware counters available on, on the system, then we need to split the event into groups and so that in each group we could clearly uh, collect them all at one time successfully. And uh, uh, for, for this one here, I, I think uh, currently our uh, perf tool do the event grouping for uh, metric groups, but it doesn't take the uh, information of counters and the event restriction on the counters into account. So we want to propose a new uh, event grouping method here to help uh, trying to improve at least the, the uh, grouping result. So before I uh, dive into the detail of the, the algorithm or the method itself, I want to use this simple example to, to show some context, to set up some context here. So in this example here, we have a, a list of metrics we want to collect. There are three metrics here. Um, we use this as an example because this is kind of a very common use case that uh, when we do performance analysis, we might want to collect more than one metric at one time. And here in our example, we have different number of events for each metric, but we do want to um, ensure that we have this older event for one metric that trying to make them collect together to, uh, to have better accuracy. So in, in this uh, environment, uh, I'm, I'm trying to make it simple. So we have only three counters available. Of course, we have more than that in the real system. But here we have only three of them. And uh, in, uh, based on the list of metrics and the events that we need to collect, uh, we, uh, in total, we will need to collect five events. And uh, at the same time, also trying to make the example easier to, to show the uh, context here contact here, we have the counters uh, restrictions for, for them very uh, simple that all the events could be collected by all the counters I have. So then when I start to do the actual grouping, if I don't have information about the total number of counters I have on the system, I might end up with a grouping results like showing in, in the circle here that I have three groups and the first group actually have four events, which we can clearly uh, see that this is not a valid grouping because I don't have so many counters for it. Then 
a very easy and simple solution to improve this is that we could place the event four into a new group. Then we, I have four groups in total, and every one group could be collected all at once. But if we look at the grouping result here, we can clearly see that we have so many groups, and some of the group only collect one or two events. We are not fully utilizing our counters. So we say that this is functional, but not very efficient. If we have some more information, then we might be able to create another grouping that we have only uh, two groups and uh, we could be able to collect all the five events we need. And uh, in addition to last number of total groups here, we also could see that uh, we have the event three in collect repeatedly because it is uh, being used in like multiple uh, metrics here. And also uh, for the second group, we can see that we collect event three, four, five. That's all the events that needed for, for the metric two. So for, for this uh, several different reasons, we believe that this grouping is actually both functional and the better than the one that we have before. With all this uh, background uh, described, I want to uh, start to propose our new metric grouping, uh, metric group event grouping method that uh, we want to say that at least we could try to uh, ensure that we can create a functional grouping if we have the information about how many counters we have and uh, what's the restriction for all the events we need to collect. Because to get functional grouping is, is actually very easy. We just need to ensure two things. One is that we only place events to the counter that support them. And then the second one is that we don't put too many events in the same group to exceed the total number of counters there are. So to achieve this, we need some extra information so that we could do this in at the execution time of the perf tool. So well, the first thing is that we want to know what's the counter restriction, restrictions your events uh, have. So this information we could uh, very easily describe into JSON files. And a second information is that how many counters and the PMUs there are on your system. This could also be very easily described in the JSON files. So for both of these two, uh, I think most of the information we need are already existing in, in our, um, uh, the, in the GitHub repo repository that we provide from the project Valkyrie. So we just uh, need to include this information into per source code and then do the, uh, load this information uh, from the PMU events at the execution time of Perf2. But there is an, a, a third piece of information that we uh, still need to resolve to help improve the result. That is the actual count availability on your system. Because there are situations that not all the counters are uh, accessible to the user when they run the Perf2. So uh, this happens in the case that um, maybe there are multiple users using Perf at the same time or were in uh, maybe a virtual environment. So this is the part that we still working on. And if you have any like suggestions or good ideas, please join uh, our discussion. A little bit more detail about the grouping method. Um, the, this grouping method is actually very uh, easy. We could very uh, uh, simply describe this in three steps. So at the, the first step here, we, when, when we need to do the event grouping at the execution time of the perf tool, we need to, like uh, I described, we need to know the information about how many counters we have and also uh, what's the event list that we need to collect. That's the, that's the list of events that we get from the command line from the perfstat-m uh, command. And then we also want to know uh, for this list of events, what type of uh, restrictions we have. So I have a very, uh, a box here. This is not 
for reading for now because it, because this is just for reference that we have like a list of six uh, restrictions, six, six types of restrictions. But just for reference, if you are interested, you can check this out later. So for for all these informations, uh, when I get them at the ex ex execution time, uh, then I could start to do the real uh, group. Uh, generation. So for here, in, in our current implementation, we uh, have a combined big list of events based on the metrics that we want to collect. So for this list of events, we uh, go through each one of them and then check which PMU or PMUs this event needs to be collected on. And then for each PMU, we, we will create a list of group for them for this PMU. So based on the PMUs that this event requires, then we start to search in the list of group and trying to find if there is a space left for this event. Meaning in this group, we still have a counter, at least one counter available and support this event. If that's the case, then we can uh, successfully fill this event into the group and uh, set the bitmap for, the, uh, for this uh, and then continue to the next event. If we cannot find another another space available, then we just create a new group for it and insert it into our, uh, the PMU uh, group list. So after we finish all the groups, then we go to the last step here that we just generate the grouping string. So for each one group in the group list, we have one grouping string for it. And the rest of step, remain the same like how currently the perf tool works. Um, for this uh, whole method, we have an implementation and posted a RFC patch to the link that I include here. So please, if you are interested, check it out and give us some feedback. So one last thing about this uh, event grouping method is that so far, We've, uh, I've been trying to say that we want to in, in, ensure at least functional grouping, but at least uh, actually we want to improve it to not only to make it not only functional but also to do good groupings. So for uh, good grouping, there are some challenges here. So um, for a good grouping, I think um, there are at least two conditions we can come, uh, think of. The first one is that for each group, we, we want to uh, have high counter utilization. So that the, the higher counter utilization, the more likely that I could use less total number of groups to finish all the events I need, then I will have better uh, time multiplexing and the likely to have better accuracy of my metric and events. But at the same time, uh, we've already been saying that metric is um, requires a list of events. So we also want to try to ensure that for the list of events for one metric, we put them into the same group or at least a neighboring group so that we could have better accuracy on, on this metric. But if we think about these two conditions, they actually conflicting with each other. So this is a interesting thing that I think uh, worth to discuss. So please, please check out the, the code patch and give us some suggestions and your good ideas about it. So I am going to go into a, another topic. And before that, is there any questions? Yeah, a question about the grouping example you gave with the events one through five. So um, you filled event three twice, but some of the other events did show up in multiple metrics. So I was wondering, like, how do you decide which event you want to overrepresent in this? And would it be better to add more groups so that you can more fairly get samples for like all the events. So like event one could appear in like another group just so it's more fair so that like event three here isn't oversampled compared to other events. Yeah, I think this is a very good question. And like I just described in the discussion part, this is a kind of challenging and conflicting situation. If we put another group here 
and repeat more events, then we will have more total number of groups and less time multiplexing uh, percentage here. So which one is actually better? I think it's hard to say. It depends on a lot of things. <laughs> So let's say in this case, I have six counters and you form that two groups and then where event three is repeated, like then I can schedule like the both groups simultaneously. But if the one event is repeated in <clears throat> one of uh, two groups, then how do you compute the values while calculating the end at the end? So are you saying if we have six counters? Mm -hmm. Assuming in this case, I have six counters. So right? in this case, if we have six counters, we don't need multiplexing anymore. Okay, so you'll have like one group with all the five. Yes. Thanks. And another question uh, on the last slide before you went to the web thing, where you talk about the locality of events, good locality of events, but same on neighboring groups. How do you know which are of them? Like, does the micro architects or like the hardware vendor tells you that like these are events that are uh, have good locality or how do we decide that so <laughs> this locality word is like i created okay, so it's not so, related to like cash locality or those events no, nearby so it's the actually, like, if we look at yeah if we look at the example here that's that means for the, for example the metric one i have four <laughs> events i want them to be in same group or or neighboring group uh, okay, okay, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, I misunderstood. <laughs> Sorry for misleading. I uh, have a question. So, when you do this uh, grouping of events, when you load it, do you load them like a per task event or there's a per CPU event? I think that's a different. So it, it, it's the same for both of them. If you're doing task based profiling, we will program the program the events with the, the groups, uh, or if you're doing CPU, we'll, we'll, we'll program the same events, the same grouping. Uh, the, the tasks or CPU don't, don't implicate it. Um, okay, so the, 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 quest, uh, the reason I ask is like, uh, I think in the kernel that per task, uh, per CPU event has a higher priority to get the counters, uh, which means like uh, uh, if there are others using it, uh, I think this, this is actually common for like our production. Like we have system wide and the service we mm -hmm. have their own. So it's a kind of the ordering like will change the uh, behavior. Like if you do the per CPU, the per task yes. will have to wait. If you do the other way, like you probably get preempted by the per CPU event. Yeah, I, I rewrote that code. Um, so <laughs> very, very familiar with it. But the, as Waylon was saying, we were doing a kind of a static uh, determination of what the grouping should be based on like which metrics you want to have. Uh, and this determination is done in the perf tool and it's assuming it has access to all of the counters. So, uh, you know, it's assuming that you don't have any CPU wide profiling happening or any, uh, task uh, profiling happening at the same time. And it, it's naive in that regard. Um, but how we fix that is a more complicated problem and we're not up to solving that at the moment. Thank you. But if that's a common use case, that could be one improvement we can add to the dynamic counter availability part. Is that? Yeah, I think the dynamic, uh, or I was thinking maybe you want to just restructure some of the group in the kernel because it's, it's going to change. Yes, <laughs> yes. So if that's a common use case, then we can try to describe it in some way that when we do the grouping, we take this into the account as well. We're, we're doing the groupings in the tools and the, the kernel's also doing its own things with, with groups uh, and so on. And it, it, it's troublesome to work out where you should be doing what. Um, you know, the, the kernel uh, algorithm is, is somewhat simple. Um, and yeah, we could make the kernel more complicated, but that would have like context switching costs and, and things like that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, the next topic is about the timed PEPs. So timed PEPs, this is an enhancement. We are going to provide 
as a new feature to our new uh, generation of Intel processors. So this one, it records a retire latency. The retire latency meaning the CPU cycles between the retirement of two instructions, your current instruction and the one that before it. So it uh, uses a six bit field and the PAPS basic info group like shown in the table here. So for uh, any new uh, Intel processors that support this, it will set the new bit, the PAPS timing info bit. Um, to using this timed PAPS, we, we could increase the accuracy of some of our T, TMA metrics because uh, before the TPAPs, uh, sometimes for some of the latencies in, in the metric, we have to use a constant value. But this value is actually could vary based on the workload and your platform. So with T, uh, TPAPs, we will be able to get even more accurate metric results in these cases. Um, for the TPAPs, the status in the perf tool, the sampling mode, the perf record, we already have this enabled and upstream. So if you uh, check out the latest uh, perf code and also have a, a newer version of the Linux kernel source code, and you should, you, you could be able to run the perf record dash W on a platform that support this. Uh, and then, in the counting mode, because we want to support this in the TMA, then we will also need to support this in the counting mode. And this part, this is a, a still working in progress. And we want to describe a little bit more detail about how we are planning to support this in uh, the perf tool. So because perhaps this is a sampling feature, to uh, enable this in the counting mode, we have to, uh, not have to, but we, we want to use both perf uh, record and perf stat so that when, uh, from the command line, the user do a perf stat dash M with a TMA metric that require retire latency, then perf stat would fork and launch perf record with the list of events that we need retire latency for it. So after that, perf set and perf record will, will work at the uh, same time in, the, in your system. And then at the time that perf set need this retire latency value, it will send the signal to perf record. Then perf record will send the sampling data back for perf set to process this sampling data and get the retire latency value out. Any question? And then, Perf cell will calculate the metric value and uh, print it out to, to give it to the user. So uh, for this work, we are implementing it and testing it in our uh, new platform. And I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments on this. So why do you need to fork and and then hand the data back? Just record and then uh, operate afterwards in a pipe on the on the recorded data. I think that's very simpler. Yes. I don't I don't see the the, the point of having the, the the whole fork thing there. There there isn't. It's basically the, the way the code base at the moment is set up is that you, you, it, it kind of like everything gets globally set up either for sampling or for counting. And so just to simplify things to get something working, we're doing the, the fork and then uh, piping things. We're, we're piping the results of the perf record back to the perf stat. Yeah. There's, there's no reason why you couldn't be doing everything as a single process. Um, but no, I mean, I mean, the, the question is what. Why don't you just record the stuff and then uh, do the do the statistics on it? That should just work. No? I think the reason it, it's done like this is because you want to measure the timing during the measurement of the counts so that you get the, the closest possible. Right? 
Okay, we're out of time. Thank you so much. Okay, yep, thank you.